Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be there with you today to present uh, what we are doing in the context of the task force on best practices. Just to add, I'm not the only leader for this task force. We are two in FO working on this task force, two leaders, uh, co-leaders. Uh, my colleague Vera Borger is working closely with us and uh, I have key support from Andrea. Andrea. Romero Montoya uh, to facilitate this task force. Next, please, Andrea. This task force on best practices uh, uh, has established terms of reference with a few outputs, priority outputs on uh, prioritization of ecosystems, identification of key resource partners, capacity need assessment, development of knowledge and learning plan, drafting towers terms of reference uh, of the decade flagship products. And of course, we want to collect uh, and capitalize uh, good practices. It's a collaborative effort. Uh, we have currently 138 members from 57 organizations. And uh, the IUCN CEM is a key partner uh, on several uh, uh, outputs. Next, please. Recently, in 2021, we worked mainly on uh, the three uh, packages of activities. Uh, we define principle for ecosystem restoration uh, in with a strong partnership within the task force with IUC and CEM and the Society for Ecological Restoration. And we now have 10 principles applicable across all sectors, biome, and regions. I will present them later. We have a package of activity on good practices, collection and capitalization. Uh, we prepared a template within the task force to, to uh, facilitate the collection of good practices. And we try also to capitalize on existing practices and with the idea to build on existing uh, platforms such as WOCAT or Panorama. Finally, uh, we have a package on global restoration capacity need assessment uh, done this year. I will present few results today. Next, please, Andrea. Uh, for the principle, uh, of course, we built on uh, existing publication and, uh, and uh, framework on, on restoration in different contexts, the, the GPFLR, the Society for Ecological Restoration, uh, or other publication uh, already presented some principle on restoration. And building on this, next please, uh, we tried to uh, find some uh, uh, principles that are respecting the, the, the continuum uh, of activities that are uh, expected during the decade. Next, please. And based on this, uh, we prepare a first draft in March, uh, 20, February, March 2021, uh, a kind of synthesis of the published principle for different type of restoration activities. Then uh, we manage uh, uh, and organize an expert consultation with the key support of the Society for Ecological Restoration and IUC and CEM during the third global forum on ecological restoration. We also consulted the task force members as a science task force, and of course, uh, senior management in FO and UNEP. Uh, based on the last version in May 2021, we organized an online global consultation uh, during the summer. And uh, in August, we finalized uh, the document to be published and released uh, during the World Conservation Congress in Marseille um, during a side event co-organized with IUCN Science Task Force and with Cara uh, uh, Nelson who will join us and will present the principle during this event. Uh, this publication will be uh, a joint publication between uh, UNEP, uh, uh, FAO, uh, IUCN CEM and of course uh, um, Society for Ecological Restoration. Based on those principles, we will prepare standard of practice, uh, standards of practice uh, during the upcoming weeks. Next, please. Okay, uh, the 10 principles are focused on, okay, contribution to SDG, uh, inclusion, how to, to be sure that we have uh, inclusive uh, and participatory governance, uh, continuum of restoration activity, uh, and to achieve the highest level of recovery for 
multiple purpose, biodiversity, ecosystem health, and integrity, human well-being, to want to address direct and indirect causes of ecosystem degradation. Uh, we want to have um, well-defined short, medium, and long-term ecological and cultural and socioeconomic objective and goals. We want to incorporate all type of knowledge and uh, including uh, um, uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous people knowledge, and to promote exchange of this knowledge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want, we have not a lot of time, but you can read on the slide and the publication uh, will be available soon. Next, please. Um, we have uh, a result ongoing in the context of the good practice collection and capitalization work package. Uh, what we did is we take stock from, we took stock from a, a existing knowledge platform, collecting already some uh, good practices, WOCAT, Panorama, conservation evidence, reforms, etc. Uh, and we prepared a repository uh, on the UN Decade website uh, for, for those uh, existing uh, platform. And we will also continue to collect new practices. We prepared the template. The template will be on the firm platform to be presented soon by Julian Fox, my colleague in charge of the monitoring uh, task force. Uh, and uh, we will try to give a kind of label or badge, uh, uh, UN Decade label to or badge to, to, to each good practices to be collected uh, on our own platform, the firm platform or in other platforms. The idea is to encourage people to uh, share their practices. Next, please. Finally, the capacity need assessment. Uh, we manage this to, uh, with the idea to prepare a, a knowledge and learning plan after based on a, a, a good understanding on the, of the need of different stakeholder groups. So we elaborated a survey with, uh, within the task force with the key support of a lot of partners. We did a, a stakeholder consultation. We tested the pilot. Then we move forward with the data collection in February, May 2021. And finally, we presented the key findings during uh, the event, uh, the launching event of the decade in early June. And we will present a more detailed key findings uh, during our joint side event uh, with uh, IUCN CEM uh, uh, during the uh, Congress in Marseille. And based on the report in preparation, we will prepare a knowledge and learning action plan. Next, please. Brock, if I am too long, feel free to, to, to cut me. Yeah? Uh, I, I, have, I can be faster if needed. Uh, the capacity need assessment uh, is, uh, uh, was, was and, and the survey was, was prepared with the idea to question different stakeholder groups. Uh, the, present, the stakeholder group's representation of the respondent are as available on this slide. You can see that we had a lot of government, NGOs, and other national and international level, local or sub-national uh, partners, research and education, investors, donors, uh, private sector, uh, land users, communities, interest group. You can see the repartition we received one, thousand three or four hundred I don't remember exactly uh, uh, answers to, to to the to the survey next please uh, based on the yeah the the the, the, the uh, answers received we were able to analyze the manager gap for each group for government NGO and those national or international partners the issue in terms of mobilizing finance for restoration is clearly one important uh, gap, but we need also to engage more uh, intersectorial uh, uh, approaches and to engage the different actors of different sectors. Uh, we need to work more on policy and action and to build capacity on policy and, uh, uh, and to support also the implementation. Um, those needs are co some common to, to another stakeholder groups, the local and subnational government, NGOs, and CBOs. So it means that those needs that are uh, highlighted in those uh, bubbles uh, are at the intersection are for two 
stakeholder groups. There is a need at local level on, also on planning uh, for subnational targets, uh, monitoring, support is needed at local level, landscape level. The research and the education group uh, uh, yeah, highlighted the fact that there is strong need in terms of assessment of cost and benefits of degradation and restoration. We need to develop better decision support tools, model and guidelines on several issues. And we need also to uh, enhance capacity and support uh, uh, provide support services to, uh, uh, to, to local stakeholders. Next, please. Uh, again, the investors, the donors, and the private sector highlighted the fact that we need sustainable financing for restoration, long-term funding mechanism, innovative financing solution, risk sharing mechanism, access to funding by community, uh, marginalized, uh, mar marginalized community, and, and, and grassroots groups uh, we need to manage better the management to manage better the investment risks uh, with risk mit mitigation measures uh, bankable business plan and business models and finally the land users the community and interest group highlighted again the need for mobilization of finance for community level restoration uh, at, for restoration activities they highlighted again the fact that we need implementation and monitoring support uh, uh, at this scale on to help them to manage land use conflicts uh, align plan with subnational and national ones uh, we need to support uh, the development of uh, the organization and the capacity of the organization uh, particularly uh, indigenous people and uh, uh, to, provoke, to, to build on traditional restoration practices. We need to uh, work on value chains, sustainable value chains, etc. etc. Next, please. You can have more detail on our website. We have a web page uh, describing what we are doing. Uh, we have now a leaflet describing where we are and we will update it regularly. And of course, the reports to be published soon will be available for uh, any uh, interested uh, people. And the task force is still open. If uh, we have some uh, partners in the IUCN CEM group ready to invest time with us uh, on uh, some activities, uh, everyone is welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Christoph, for the excellent presentation on best practices task force. Let's move now to Julian Fox, who will present on the monitoring task force. Thanks, Cara. Yeah, I hope you can help me. I hope you can hear me well. <laughs> Sorry, it's quite late in Rome, but great to be here. And I'll, I'll give you a bit of an overview of um, the task force on monitoring and what we've been doing up until now. So we were launched um, March 31st in 2020, actually just as Italy went into lockdown. And, uh, but we we're very lucky and, and similar to the task force on best practices. I think the spirit of the UN decade is, is quite exciting. This, this element of partnership and collaboration is really strong. So we had great, um, great uh, collaboration across across many organizations including IUCN and many others that are with us today and uh, the task force uh, basically we we were asked to develop a, a framework on ecosystem restoration monitoring really I would say an umbrella uh, monitoring framework you know there are a lot of efforts going on on tools and platforms for monitoring um, different ecosystems so try and integrate these as much as possible share data across um, platforms and sort of and also help, I think, uh, restoration stakeholders monitoring at, at different scales, uh, a lot of challenges, actually. And that, that's where we wanted to map out all the technical solutions with training material for monitoring, you know, those key indicators uh, for, for monitoring restoration for countries, but also for all types of restoration stakeholders. And we hoped to do country pilots and case studies. And, you know, I think these days, transparency and data access is key. So we always had the idea we would like to create a geospatial dissemination platform. And we did, uh, and I'll mention it in a moment. So exactly, we were established in March last year. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's been really exciting, actually. Uh, many, many experts have joined us um, from over 100 organizations. Really, I think there's sort of a shared vision now that, that sound monitoring, sound data can catalyze investments and ensure really science-based actions. So that's our, that's our shared vision. Um, you know, we have uh, many, all the ecosystems in, in the UN decade. So we decided to, to divide up the experts according to the terrestrial um, sub task force, which is, which is land based, basically. Um, aquatic and transitional ecosystems, which is everything else, uh, mainly coastal, uh, inland waters, mangroves, peatlands, lakes, rivers coral reefs, <laughs> very challenging. And the first two, I would say, have a biophysical focus, so really biophysical monitoring. The last one is on socioeconomics, which is really key, I think, to the success of the decade. So decade management suggested we have a specific group looking at that. And, um, and basically, this, the sub-task forces try to meet uh, semi-regularly and, and provide inputs up into the main uh, monitoring task force. And there's also a summary note, which you can um, access there with, with recordings of all our various meetings we've had over the last um, year and a half and, and where we're at. And, and we try and update that quite regularly. So um, what, how far have we got and what do we need to do? Well, we launched a minimum viable product of our platform in June 2021. It's really, I would say, a geospatial dissemination platform that still needs to be populated with, with a lot of data for different ecosystems. At the moment, it's sort of an empty framework, but we have a lot of work to do to populate it with geospatial data that corresponds to the, those key indicators for monitoring restoration. We, we launched some tools that we think are useful and that stakeholders said that they would can help them monitor restoration. One of them is in our cloud-based um, platform called Sepal. Uh, for planning, for planning restoration, considering both biophysical and socioeconomic elements. We also had a workshop where we, where we mapped out over 150 tools and platforms for, for restoration monitoring. And we'll have another work, workshop in September where we're going to link um, all those tools and platforms to the stakeholders at different scales and try and see I would say match make uh, you know a tool and a platform to a different to a particular stakeholder because in restoration there are many stakeholders um, and we want to make sure that they have access to the to the best tools and platforms to 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 monitor their efforts and we also just before um, World Environment Day the launch of the decade we had a nice joint communication piece in Forbes with some of the other key partners working on monitoring including IUCN the Global Restoration Observatory, ETH Zurich, with the Restore platform, the World Economic Forum, who are, who are working a lot on bringing the private sector to restoration, and, and World Resources Institute. So that's where we got to uh, for World Environment Day. And now we continue to strengthen, strengthen the functionalities of the firm, um, continue to populate it with data, um, and we're working on a registry because we see you know, restoration, there are many projects and we would like to provide a place where people can, can register their project in, a, in sort of in a, in a fairly simple way. And if they would like, they can then share their project information in the, in the firm platform. Um, we are also progressing on sort of global project level indicator selection and also in close collaboration with the Global Restoration Observatory who are looking at project level indicator selection. Um, to measure restoration progress at different scales. As I said, we'll have our second workshop on technology and innovation for restoration monitoring in September. And we hope, to, we hope to link more tools and platforms to the firm and also link the firm to other monitoring platforms that are, that are, are available and are continued to evolve. So the minimum viable product platform, it's, um, we like it and restoration stakeholders seem to like it. It just allows, at the moment we put in um, some really nice geospatial data related to soil, water, vegetation and socioeconomics. So you can jump in there and you can, you can scan to your area of interest and, um, and you can also upload your own data in your own private workspace, which is nice. And, and we also link in within the platform some tools and guidance for restoration planning and monitoring. Um, as I said, you can upload your own data locally, nationally, regionally into a private workspace so you can do some analysis. 
And you can create little impact stories. We have this functionality where, you know, if you want to, if you want to tell a story about your restoration project, you can create that and you can share it with other, with other people that may be interested in what you're doing. Um, and you can directly apply some functionality from our cloud computing platform, SEPAR, which, which works on mobile phones, which is very nice. So I think all the links are there as well as some descriptive information. And we have a user guide as well that's available when you, when you enter the platform. So the firm registry is under development. I mean, the idea is that um, we want to we want to create a place where people can register their projects and uh, i think for national governments this would be a very useful tool when you know they have a lot of restoration activities at different scales and they want to integrate them into a national type report they can use the registry function to to basically organize all the different restoration projects and we hope it to be interoperable and integrate with other other platforms such as IUCN's restoration barometer restore and other, other platforms being developed by um, WRI. I mean, there, I, there's a great collaborative spirit uh, for the decade. And I think all the, all the people that are working on restoration monitoring have this vision that we, we want to share information across platforms as much as possible. We want stakeholders to be able to, you know, if they want to enter their data into a particular platform, we don't want them to worry about having to enter it into another platform. We want everything to be interoperable. And there's actually a terms of reference. And I, I think a consultant working at the moment on that interoperability and that data sharing you know, for geospatial data for restoration projects. So we launched the firm. Um, what, where do we go from here? As I said, we work on the registry. We, we make sure it's interoperable with other restoration platforms. We link more tools and platforms to the firm. We continue to create guidelines for restoration monitoring. And we're starting to sort of deploy to countries that are interested in this. Um, indicators for global level monitoring and project level, we're, we're working on that. And in the in this second half of the year, we'll fully integrate with the Decade Digital Hub, which is the, I would say, the restoration uh, one-stop shop uh, for the UN Decade. But we won't stop work. I mean, we're going to work over the next 10 years. It is a decade uh, aligning with the SDG uh, Decade of Action. So we want, we want uh, the firm to be really useful for restoration and restoration monitoring, and we'll continue to strengthen it through the next 10 years. So just a quick insight on a workshop we have coming up, which I hope you'll, you'll see and, and I hope you can join. But we're really going to present what we found when we mapped out all the restoration tools and platforms. And we created some nice uh, visualization databases with, with partners, actually. And, um, and we're also going to map those tools and platforms to the different types of users, you know, the private sector, governments, NGOs, and also different scales uh, from local level, um, um, national to global. And uh, this, this workshop will also be a contribution to the UN Food System Summit, where we have under the Restore Action Track, Action Track 3, we have a cluster called Monitoring Stakeholders and Evidence and Driving Restoration Impact. So it'll be co-branded UN Decade uh, and the UN Food System Summit, which is, has some nice synergies. And that's, uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much and uh, happy to take questions. Um, I will stop sharing now. Julian, thank you so much. It's amazing to see how much work has been done to pull together the platform. And there's clearly been a need to pull together surrounding restoration monitoring. And of course, identifying best practices and uh, monitoring programs all are underpinned by sound science. And so our last presenter today will be Luke presenting on the work of the Science Task Force. And then as a reminder to participants, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Please type your questions in the Q&A window and not in the chat box because we won't look there for asking questions. Well, thank you. And a good day to you all who are connected to this webinar. Uh, I'm very pleased to join the panel. Um, in the context of the launch of uh, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, the Science Tax Force has led the production of a, a think piece titled Science-Based Ecosystem Restoration for the 2020s and Beyond. 
and I'm very much pleased today to provide you with an overview of the think piece in advance of the official launch that will take place in Marseille in the context of the uh, World Congress, World Conser Conservation Congress. I have the privilege of facilitation the Science Tax Force. Um, it is, uh, yeah, uh, it is a, a task force that is composed of uh, uh, six eminent scientists. Uh, some of them that you know, of course, you know uh, Angela Andrade, who's the chair of the IUCN CEM. Uh, you might also know Mike Ackerman, uh, Gam Shimre, Bernardo Priya. Uh, Bernardo Strasbourg, sorry, and uh, Priya, as well as uh, you might also know uh, James Cairo. The task force is ably uh, coordinated by uh, Adriana Vidal of IUCN. So, um, a, a, maybe a quick uh, info about the mandate uh, of the task force. The task force is uh, designed to provide as an authoritative uh, reference point to the uh, decade scientific uh, advices to the decade advisory board, as well as to the strategy group of the UN uh, decade, which are UNEP and FAO. And this, the, the task force can also choose to address specific topics related to uh, the implementation of uh, the Decade in coordination, of course, with the uh, IUCN and this Decade Strategy Group, and as well as the Advisory Board. The Decade can also the the the, the STF can also receive uh, uh, requests uh, from UN, UNEP, and FAO at the Decade Strategy Group uh, to work on specific tasks and provide report on it, and. The primary output that is expected from uh, the STF is precisely the thing piece about which I will present uh, some of uh, as except now. And uh, the IUCN is the one who has convened and is organizing the STF on behalf of the co-lead agencies of the decade to mean FAO and UNEF. So the, the, the thing piece provide uh, some answers to four fundamental questions. Uh, we have elaborated on five key messages and provided some um, recommendations. What are the uh, fundamental questions about? First, what does it mean to undertake uh, ecosystem restoration? The second one is what, why have previous uh, efforts been only partially successful? Of course, we need to come up with the why because that will help us design or redesign or shape differently our course of action in implementing the decade. And the third question is how can individual group and sectors contribute to effective ecosystem restoration? And uh, in that one, it, we have made quite crystal clear that uh, the impetus for restoration can come from everyone, individuals, communities, government, non-governmental organization, and the private sector. Restoration acts of action that incorporate local knowledge and legitimize the role of communities as stewards of land and waters and landscape, seascape, are likely to be the most successful. And the private sector, by re redesigning, reconsidering their business model, uh, can certainly come up with nature positive production schemes that will contribute to scale up the restoration efforts. And the fourth and last question was what key action can multiple sectors of society take to ignite and sustain? a long lasting ecosystem restoration movement. And, and in that one, you, you will see that what is key here is having a common set of shared principle and vision. So let me now start by sharing uh, the five 
key messages. The, the first one is ecosystem restoration offers multiple social and environmental benefits, including enhancing human health and well being, helping mitigate and adapt to climate change, improving water quality and flow, reducing soil erosion and flooding, regaining soil fertility, and preventing species extension. And in that, I wish to bring forth that different outcome, benefit, and cost from restoration action become manifest over different temporal and spatial scales. And what is key is to ensure that those are fairly shared, that some are not uh, hijacking the benefit of restoration because that will not make uh, the, the solution uh, sustainable. And therefore, understanding the distribution of benefit and cost associated with restoration action is critical uh, to ensure sustainability and scaling up. We must make sure that we, we, we do avoid that aggregate benefit uh, uh, are actually uh, um, not showing uh, who is uh, bearing uh, or what part, what type of stakeholder is bearing the cost. And inclusive engagement in restoration planning will certainly enable more equitable distribution uh, of benefit and increase the potential for long-term success. This key message number two is about enabling conditions. The enabling conditions, particularly uh, local norms and governance can really tip the balance towards restoration. And that is key, it is fundamental. Uh, we have been used in many instances to overlook local efforts in restoration and go for um, rather top-down approaches. But if we really want uh, a sustained effort uh, to uh, realize the goal of and the vision of the decade, we must make sure that if, uh, it is uh, built on a local initiative and that the local norms and, con and co governance system are conducive for uh, the, uh, maintaining and scaling the scaling up of ecosystem restoration efforts. And so we, we, uh, in that regard, not only effective restoration entails negotiation and balancing multiple objective and forging uh, enduring and meaningful partnership with local uh, people and institutions, but also uh, here secure tenure, not only property, but user rights are critical uh, and actually a foundation for uh, local governance. And this must be reflected not only in the norms, but also in the institution that are uh, managing uh, ecosystem uh, at all level, from the, the local to the national and beyond, including the transboundary uh, ecosystem. The scaling up and the dissemination, the dissemination of ecosystem restoration may call for, and this is key, the phasing out of counter, counterproductive policies and subsidies and repurpose uh, uh, the resources for uh, conservation and restoration. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the uh, developed countries uh, are annually investing some 600 billion US dollars into uh, subsidies for agriculture. And only 5% is purposed and used effectively for conservation and uh, uh, published goods uh, uh, purposes. So we, unless we, we look at that and we repurpose we phase out what is not conducive for conservation and restoration and repurpose them, uh, you know, the, the system will continue to enhance degradation while we are aiming for restoration. So uh, and integrating and harmonizing traditional knowledge uh, with scientific knowledge is vital. And all those elements taken into consideration for the enabling condition to work for effectively. The key message three is precisely that key enabling condition, particularly uh, uh, no, that ecosystem restoration requires the management of trade-off and this must be done equitably. We used not to speak about trade-off. 
uh, but uh, trade-offs are inherent to uh, ecosystem restoration. And we, we must ensure uh, that they are managed properly. To ensure success, it is critical that uh, different perspective, goals, and needs of stakeholders are communicated and accounted for in a specially uh, explicit manner to ensure that uh, uh, the planning will also take into consideration the potential for uh, uh, trade off and find out to what extent some of them can be managed towards the building of synergies. And nature's contribution to people also vary over time and space. And rest restoring these con contribution may create winners and losers. And some, uh, we call it inescapable trade off. And the, the, that is where uh, planning must be robust, must be inclusive, and must ensure that uh, action are taken into consideration and, and those actions are ecologically sound and effective. And national government, uh, international organization, local communities, and other restoration stakeholders uh, need to identify and prioritize location and approaches for restoration action that can benefit that can balance benefits and cost and risk. A key message for is about finance. Finance uh, and market infrastructure is critical for scaling up and sustaining ecosystem restoration. The restoration, as I have mentioned already, uh, needs greatly exceed national budget, government resources, international donors, and uh, development uh, bank resources. And what we, we, we still lack 300 million uh, in the investment that are actually uh, used for ecosystem restoration. But on the other side, we still have 600 million uh, US dollars of subsidies. Some of them uh, are supporting ill design policies. And unless we reconsider them and reassess them and repurpose those resources, we are likely not to, to make it uh, and, uh, about the shortfall in investment. The potential of restoration uh, to, multiple, to address multiple goal challenges, global challenges, sorry, has stimulated the development of several innovative financial instruments, including those that supply capital and mitigate risk. And we need to share those one and uh, help uh, national government, especially, and at also at the subnational level, to consider uh, learning from them and uh, uh, disseminate, dis disseminating those who can be disseminated. And we call it the rest, uh, uh, it is called a restoration economy, and it can it is really profitable, profitable for local stakeholders, but profitable for government. The challenge that we have here is to bring government to understand to what extent it is profitable for the national economy and how they need therefore to reconsider their budget and, and take uh, and repurpose again resources for investing in the restoration economy. This is again about not only restoration per se, but we, we, we have said that it is a multi-purpose uh, endeavor that also uh, contributes both to adaptation and mitigation and uh, to avoiding uh, biodiversity loss. And the, the, the fifth key message is about adaptive management and monitoring. I think it, this will sound music to the ears of uh, Julian because uh, we are making the point that it is key that adaptive management and monitoring uh, uh, really uh, are in place uh, in a, an effective manner to ensure long-term restoration action. And the point is that monitoring must be transparent, evaluation and uh, adaptive management uh, should be integral and cross-sectional component of the ecosystem restoration process. And we must capitalize on good practices for ecosystem restoration and ensure that we learn not only for, from successes, but by the way, sometimes you learn more from failures than from successes. And, and high restoration aspirational aspirations can stimulate action and motivate engagement, but we must be aware that 
the more high they are, the more we run the risk to fail and the failure may have a, a kind of setback effect into in the uh, endeavor of the group. And the base, baseline ecological and social data and analysis are key to producing robust and restoration action plan. And in some contexts, it's not easy to come to agree on what is the baseline, but this must be discussed in a very transparent way and look at communities must be engaged actively, actively in discussing that. And the monitoring indicators should incorporate information on broader society outcome so that we for uh, benefit that are beyond sometimes the, the, the landscape or the seascape where the restoration uh, has taken place. So I will conclude with a few recommendations. Uh, the recommendations are meant to contribute to building the ecosystem restoration movement. Restoration, ecosystem restoration opens new opportunities for engaging uh, uh, learning and uh, coming up with uh, innovation through the development of long-term partnership and collective action. And when we understand that, uh, how we proceed about ecosystem initiative from the start is should be different. And community and landscape uh, right holders and stakeholders need to be recognized and empowered as land steward, property owners and users for local decision uh, as local decision makers, or at least to be around the table when local decisions uh, are, are made. And effective restoration action requires fundamental shift in economy and policy and in institution towards a focus on the long-term and very benefit of functioning uh, and diverse ecosystem. And the ideal of the decade, uh, meaning partnership, inclusiveness, and joint uh, coordinated action need to be based on shared core principle, good practices, and, uh, and practical approaches uh, to monitoring and evaluation. And this must be done from the local level to the global level. The efforts are underway, uh, listening to colleagues like Christophe and Julian, it shows clearly that the efforts are there, but you must make sure that uh, it is both uh, bottom up and, and, and top down. And actually what is challenging here is the bottom, bottom up part of it. And ecosystem restoration action requires user-friendly information, sharing and inclusive engagement from the onset. And that one, uh, we must, it is not easy to ensure that what we say in the way we are saying it uh, is uh, user-friendly for all people involved. So, as I said, the Think Peace will be launched early September at the World the IUCN World uh, Conservation Congress. And in Q4 this year, this year IUCN will start the process of uh, uh, convening the, the STF uh, uh, for the activities of 2020. And if you, uh, you need, you want more information about uh, the STF, please contact uh, uh, Mrs. Adriana Vidal, uh, you can see her, her email there. So thank you very much. Thanks so much to all of our speakers. We are just two months past the launch of the decade and all of this amazing work has happened, of course, in anticipation of the decade, but it's very inspiring to think two months in what we've achieved at pulling the global restoration community together. So I wanna thank each of you for all the work that you've done with your task forces and being a part of Generation Restoration. I'm gonna moderate for about 10 minutes uh, a round of question and answers. Thanks to those of you who submitted questions. Um, and at the end, we can have just a few brief words from our speaker about their thoughts on the decade overall. And I'm gonna start with a question to Christoph. And we have Andrea Romero here, who is a forest, uh, her background's in forest management, forest engineering in many parts of the world from Colombia. And she joined FAO 
to support the best practices task force in 2020. And the question came in, this is from Linda Spencer, and she's asking specifically about the platform pulling together the databases of best practices, how that's gonna be organized and whether so maybe a few words on what the platform will look like. Okay, maybe I can start and uh, Andrea will uh, uh, provide more details. But yes, to answer to this question, the idea is to have a kind of portal, uh, user-friendly, uh, to allow uh, the access to uh, the good practices with keywords, as requested by uh, uh, the, the participant, uh, and we, we, we by 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 ecosystem, by uh, a region, etc. So we, we are working on on this research uh, portal that will allow to access to the uh, good practices and hopefully in the different existing platforms too. So we we have to fix some IT issues to to build the the full and operational. Uh, intelligent uh, portal, but uh, we are working on it. And this is the idea. Maybe Andrea, you can give more detail based on your discussion with partners and uh, platforms. Yes, sure, Christoph. Um, so for the filtering all the, of the good practices, we will have as uh, main filters, region and ecosystem. But the idea is also the key, these keywords that Christoph mentioned that, that, that will be also part of, of, the, um, of the search. And in addition, we want to have also uh, practices collected by other platforms uh, connected to our platform. So all, all platforms work together. And that's why we mentioned this, you in the kit batch or, the, or, the, or this uh, type of um, yeah, of a batch in order to provide a distinction of these practices that are collected by others uh, in, behind uh, like good efforts and also to, to have all the system uh, well connected. Thank you. Great, thank you. The next question is in a similar vein, but is about the work of the monitoring task force. Julian Karen Hall asks whether there's an effort to coordinate the firm platform with Restore, and I'll just add in other monitoring platforms so there aren't mul multiple global mapping monitoring platforms. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, actually, we're in regular communication with, uh, with, with the movers and shakers in the monitoring platform space. And I think there's a call scheduled actually next week. And that includes IUCN's restoration barometer, uh, WRI, who, who have several platforms that we know of and are, are amazing, and uh, ETH's restore. So um, yeah, we come together regularly and, and we actually, the vision is that we have some interoperability, as I said, between these platforms so that stakeholders only have to enter their data once um, and then it can be sort of shared across platforms. I think that's really optimal. And that, that also depends on creating standards uh, for geospatial data, which, which we, we hope to agree on with the other platform developers. Um, yeah, so yes, basically. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. Another question about connecting different efforts, uh, and this is from Anita Dietrichson from... Um, World Wildlife Fund, and she's asking Luke about how the key messages are connected with the restoration principles um, that was supported by the Best Practices Task Force. Well, um, thank you. Uh, this, you can see that the principle uh, are connected to each of those key messages uh, uh, because all those principles are related to ecosystem restoration. And when you think of the, uh, the five key messages, uh, key message uh, one and five uh, are rather on, key message two and one and two, sorry, are on the, on the side of the restoration curve. And the other messages are on the side of uh, uh, the, the initiative of addressing and starting with uh, or facing uh, trend of degradation. 
and the principal are also work on that. So yes, you're right. We may come up with uh, uh, a, a, you know a figure that uh, shows how uh, the, the principal connects with the key messages. That's a good suggestion, a good takeaway for me. I will share with my colleagues of the STF, and we will certainly come up with something like that. That will make it crystal clear how the principal connect with the key message. Fantastic. All right, we have just time for one more question. This is for all of you. It's a really important question. This is from Shabdendu Patak, who asks, how good is private sector investors donor participation? Also, how are we ensuring concerns voices of local stakeholders affected communities are captured optimally? So two very different questions, one about um, who we have at the table. And the second is how we're making sure that all rights holders and stakeholders are engaging or have opportunities. Anyone want to start? And you could give the, share the perspective from your task force of, uh, for instance, on the best practice task force, do we have uh, all sectors represented? Um, well, based on the results of the capacity needs assessment, we have identified that the, the engagement of the finance, uh, the private sector is very low. So this is something that uh, the decade and, and from the side of the task force is something that is a, a priority that we need to address. And maybe to, to, to add on this sense from Andrea, uh, <clears throat> there, there is money available uh, to invest on, on, on restoration but there is clearly a, a, a lack of uh, what we can say a bankable project of project promoters local entrepreneurs uh, uh, sm small groups at local level landscape level sometimes they have ideas but it's difficult for them to present their ideas from the ideas to go to a project bankable appealing for investors. And uh, we really need to work on this to help to build capacity uh, of project promoters um, to allow them uh, to be able to, to discuss with the private investors and to use their, their language and to allow them to, to, to deal with, with, with the investors because there is investors interested in restoration. But sometimes, uh, the ideas and the project are not well presented uh, uh, for, for, for them. So we, we want to work on this with incubators, landscape accelerators, and things like this uh, in the context of the decade and uh, in the multi-partner trust fund in preparation to support the implementation of the decade. We have some packages of activities on, on, on this, how to build capacity to attract finance. Fantastic. Yes, I, would like to, I would like to second uh, Christoph on what you have said by highlighting the fact that at national level, there are many policies that can't work for restoration, even though, uh, you know, uh, local uh, stakeholders are willing to do something to restore. The fact that the valuation of the product of the restoration is so low or it's counterproductive for existing policies, it can't work for them. So. Not only that we need incubators, but we also need to uh, uh, you know, uh, reach out to local national government to, so that they will work in considering the, the policies that they do have and the subsidies that are, that are counterproductive and find out how they can phase them out and it will work for the economy, it will work for the resilience of the economy. That work is something that we also need to do. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Luke. And we're right on the hour here, so it's time to close out the webinar. I would like for each of you to have the opportunity to share a few quick words on how you're feeling at the start of this decade. But before you do so, I'll put a plug in for next month's webinar, which will be on using uh, ecosystem risk assessment science in the restoration planning and implementation and monitoring process. And that will be focusing on specifically the red list of ecosystems. So we'll go backwards here. Luke, a couple of words on how you're feeling about the decade. 
Well, uh, I am motivated. I am even thrilled by in the dynamic, the, you know, the momentum in the making, and it is coming strongly uh, for restoration uh, for the decade. I have seen many decades in the past, but this one uh, seems and looks special. And the partnership that is coming up is coming up strongly. So I look forward very much to continue pushing from my end. Fantastic, Julian. I think Luke summed it up really well. I mean, the level of partnership and collaboration, I haven't seen anything like it before. So I'm energized <laughs> and the energy is coming from others. So it's going to be a really exciting decade that hopefully really supports the SDG process and really catalyzes change. So. Christoph? Oh, yeah. So the, the momentum is excellent. And uh, I am working for on restoration and forest landscape restoration for years now. And to have this decade starting, it's a key opportunity to, to upscale uh, what we are doing to uh, approach and connect uh, several uh, group of community of practice uh, working on restoration in marine ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, we have a lot to do um, on this and uh, it's a, an amazing journey we are starting. Great. Well, thanks to all of you for sharing your thoughts on the journey and all of your hard work. Thanks to our participants, and we hope we'll see you next month. Scroll up in the chat if you want to see how to engage in IUCN CEM, the webinar series, and uh, feel free to contact me or Brock if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,